who said it may be violative of the basic structure of the constitution, in which case it will be struck down by the court. So why do you think it could violate the basic structure? Because it impacts federalism in a big way. And you know, many of the reasons which they have given for the purposes that we come to that, I'm sure in the course of the interview, as to why this should be done, cannot be addressed even otherwise without, it, without amending the constitution. But you believe that this could violate secularism? Could. Yeah, of course, it could violate, not secularism. It could violate the federal structure of the country. And therefore, it would be violative of the basic structure itself? It could be. I'm not saying it would be. It could be. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. On Wednesday, the Cabinet approved the Coven Committee's recommendation of One Nation, One Election. The Prime Minister said it would make India's democracy more vibrant and participative. But this only begs the question, is it justified and desirable? And what will be its impact on a country of India's size and constitutional character? My guest is former Law Minister and Rajya Sabha MP, Kapil Sibyl. Kapil Sibyl, I want to focus this interview on the desirability of one nation, one election. The Prime Minister has tweeted that it will make India's democracy more vibrant and participative. Do you agree with him or do you disagree? Well, you know, my first concern is that when you are making such a major change that may in fact be violative of the basic structure of the constitution, be that as it may a change in the constitution cannot be part of a political agenda, right? When you change the constitution, it should not be based on a political agenda. This has been the BJP's political agenda. Way back in 1999, Mr. Advani said that we want one nation, one election. Then the 170th report of the election commission came. And on the basis of that, now taking this agenda forward. So, so what is happening is that they are using the process of amendment of the constitution through the political agenda that they have. A constitution is a document for posterity. It is not subservient to any political agenda, right? And what is happening, and that's my real objection, to this whole process of amendment. So when you say it's going to become participative, on the contrary, it's exclusionary. It's not participative at all. You know, I want to pick up on the thought that you began your answer with. You said it may be violative of the basic structure of the constitution, in which case it will be struck down by the court. So why do you think it could violate the basic structure? Because it impacts federalism in a big way. And you know, many of the reasons which they have given for the purposes that we come to that, I'm sure in the course of the interview, as to why this should be done, cannot be addressed even otherwise without, it, without amending the constitution. But you believe that this could violate secularism? Could. Yeah, of course, it could violate, not secularism. It could violate the federal structure of the country. And therefore it would be violative of the basic structure itself? It could be. I'm not saying it would be. It could be. This is okay. a subject matter of litigation. Let's briefly start with the reasons why people support one nation, one election. First, right. what's called the cost factor. No doubt elections every five years is a lot cheaper than multiple elections happening at different times. But Shashi Tharoor and Praveen Chakravarti have calculated that the saving is less than 5,000 crore a year. For an economy of India's size, should that be a deciding factor? In fact, cost of an election should have no relevance when you are amending the constitution. You're not amending a constitution for the cost of the election. You can't. You can't amend a constitution because it costs more in having an election. I mean, this is an absurd reason. It is unrelated. A constitution is a document for posterity. And for saving 5,000 crores, I see even 10,000 crores. This makes no difference. 
you must have cogent reasons as to why, and that must be addressed not by a political party, like 370. It must be addressed by the nation. Remember, the Constituent Assembly was formed, and you know the literacy rate at that time was 14 to 16 percent. And who were the people in the Constituent Assembly? And they debated this issue for years, for years, before India became a republic. Now you want to change the constitution through a committee report where you don't discuss it with, the, with, the, with, with all stakeholders. You get the law commission who was appointed by you, you get a recommendation. And then you have the president who should, in fact, be above party politics. He should not have, in fact, headed this committee, right? Uh, because he's the president of India. He was the president of India. So, therefore, I have really grave, grave objections to, all, to, to this. The second reason why people support one nation, one election, is that the restrictions of the model code of conduct will only apply for a very limited period, and therefore politicians can devote themselves to governance rather than campaigning. But the point is, as things stand, the model code only applies nationwide when there's a national election. At state level, it's a fairly minor concern. So again, how important a factor is this? According to me, wholly irrelevant. Because most, most of the time, even when the model code is applicable, they violate the model code on a daily basis. And, and we have objections raised before the election commission who does nothing about it. So this violation of the model code goes on even when the model code is on. So both, that so both the reasons cited for supporting one nation, one election, whether it's the cost or whether it's the application of the model code, you're saying both are irrelevant. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's then come to the arguments against one nation, one election. First of all, India needs to expand and deepen its democracy. In fact, 50 years ago, Atal Bihari Vajpayee actually wanted a right of recall. One nation, one election does precisely the opposite. It narrows our democracy by straight jacketing the opportunity for citizens to vote or to choose governments. How big a concern is this? Well, it's a very big concern. But, uh, Karan, let me go back a little. They talk about the fact that there will not be multiple elections. Just think about it. And this is what is suggested, that if during the course of a five-year term, the government falls, then you will have an election for the balance of the term. Right? Now, people who are elected to the assemblies, first of all, spend a lot of money getting elected. And if at the end of three years, the government falls, right, they know that they will, may not get elected uh, in the next two years. So the impetus of the assembly members would be that the government should not fall, even though the government has lost confidence, because nobody wants to fight an election again for a two-year term or a three-year term or a one-year term. Right? So in fact, this is anti-democratic, because even when the government has lost confidence, people will not be willing to make it fall, because they don't know whether they'll be ever, ever elected again. So at least they have a five-year term. This is completely anti-democratic. I take your point. What you're saying is because the cost of elections will remain the same, whether you're electing for a five-year term or a one-year term, people will not want to spend that same quantity of money just for a one-year term. Therefore, they will find ways of not letting the government fall and indulge in corruption and other such malpractices. It is not just the cost. It's the fact that they may not get elected. You, you know that in, in any election, about 40 to 50 percent of the people don't get re-elected. So why would they bring down a government to lose even the two-year term that they might get, the extra term that they're going to get? So it's not just the cost. And let me tell you another thing, which is far more insidious than this. This government has been actually making sure that elected governments are dethroned. This has happened in so many cases, Maharashtra, Uttarakhand, Arunachal, Madhya Pradesh, Karnataka, you know that, right? So actually, they use the constitution to do unconstitutional acts, and then they will say there'll be no election, because now the majority is on the other side. So you don't actually deal with the problem. The real problem is, how do you destabilize elected governments? 
Okay. That's the real problem. And you can amend you can amend the constitution. You don't even have to amend the constitution. You can have a law saying that anybody who actually moves from one party to another will not hold public office for the next 10 years. There'll be no, there'll be no fall of government in five years. Let me put to you a second reason why people believe one nation, one election is completely wrong for India. It contradicts the very nature and character of our country. We are not one nation, one religion. We are not one nation, one language. We are not one nation, one culture. We are not one nation, one cuisine. We are a union of states where the differences are actually the richness of our country. Doesn't one nation, one election detract from that? Absolutely. This can happen now in small nations. For example, there are three countries in the world which have it, which is Belgium, which is Sweden, and then I think the third country is South Africa. There's no other country in the world which has had it. And these are small countries, very small countries. Therefore, you can have it, as you said, one religion, one nation, one language. In India, actually, if you don't have an election, the local issues which are central to the administration of the government will never, will never be debated. Let because me... The, Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to take up that point you're making about local issues. The third problem with one nation, one election is the risk that you're prioritizing national issues over local issues. It therefore has a tendency of converting a federal structure, which is what India's structure is, into a unitary structure, which is what we definitely are not. How much of a concern is that? It's a great concern because what will happen is mainstream media, the way it, it is, will be sort of only talking about whoever the prime minister is and what his agendas are and the freebies that he's giving to the nation. And that will all, that will drown every local issue that's happening in the state. And people will not be able to discern one from the other. So in fact, it, that's why I think it, it impacts the basic structure of the constitution in every possible way. And you believe that this is a genuine concern that the judiciary, if petitioned, will respond to? I don't know about that, but I'm just saying that these are issues that will have to be decided and can't be decided in this lackadaisical fashion, in the sense that they set up a committee, they make these recommendations, they also set dates that this will happen in 2029. If this happens in 2029, there are 17 states in this country which will not serve a full year term between probably two to three years. Well, that's a major concern. It's not just a major concern for the governments and for the assemblies. It's also a major concern for the people who voted for those governments and for that assembly because their mandate would have been truncated without their permission. This is not the structure of the constitution that was envisaged when the constitution was framed. Elections were to be held whenever, whenever the government lost confidence. Let Apart me... Yes, Sorry, okay. carry on, carry on. Apart from the fact that there is no way that this bill can ever be passed. Apart from that. You know... Let me finally put to you another reason why one nation, one election is a very dangerous step for India to take. At a time when our parliamentary elections are becoming increasingly presidential, isn't there a danger that one nation, one election will exacerbate that trend? And worse, it could push a multi-party system, what, which is what we are and which is what we want to be, steadily towards becoming a one-party state, which we don't want to be. Exactly. I mean, that's real worry. But let's reflect a little more. Karan. Take the state of Uttar Pradesh. If Uttar Pradesh were to be a country, it would be the sixth largest country in the world. Sixth largest country. Now, can the issues of Uttar Pradesh be ever uh, discussed within the framework of a constitution of an election which, which synchronizes the national election along with the state election? Never cannot be. And we are 1.4 billion people and every part of the country is so diverse that the issues are in, entirely different. They will never come to the fore. In fact, what you could argue, perhaps even more convincingly, is that the issues of concern to Goa and Sikkim, two very small states, would never get discussed if you have one nation, one election. No one would bother about what's happening there. 
No, the prime minister, whoever he is at that time, will not bother about it at all because he'll be talking about the country. He'll not be talking about Goa. But when there's an election in Goa, it's the president who talks about Goa. The president is concerned for his party in Goa. He then go, uh, the prime minister, he then goes and sort of, uh, uh, you know, campaigns there. But here, the prime minister will not be concerned with any of this. He'll only be concerned with the national agenda. So you are actually converting the whole federal structure into a unitary structure. Absolutely. And the real losers are the small states, the Goas, the Sikkims, the Uttarakhands, the Himachal Pradeshs. No one will care about their issues or their concerns because on a national perspective, they simply don't matter. Why just the smaller states? Why not Tamil Nadu? Why not Karnataka? Why not Uttar Pradesh? Why not Kerala? These are all separate states with separate, very, very complicated issues. And people are concerned. So people in a, in a local election, a state election, want to know what, in what manner the government is going to uh, deliver on their promises. But they'll be all submerged in the national agenda, which is what has been happening all this while. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Let me at this point, Mr. Sibyl, raise with you two points or matters of detail that haven't got the attention that they deserve. Under one nation, one election, what happens to the power of a prime minister or the power of a chief minister to ask for an early dissolution? It's a power, and you know this better than me, that prime ministers and chief ministers use to discipline their own party when it only has a slender majority. But if they can't dissolve early, that power to discipline will also diminish and disappear, and that will introduce instability into the party system. Why do you say it can't dissolve early? It can. The governor may still give a report and say that, that the uh, government in the state is not being carried on in accordance with the provisions of the constitution, and the governor's rule will be imposed. Why not? President's rule can be imposed. Why but not? you're talking of a prime minister or a chief minister who chooses to dissolve early, not because he's lost his majority, but because he believes politically or strategically it is the right thing for him to do. He can do it under this under this framework. He could do it. Why not? Except that the election will be for the balance period only, whether it's Lok Sabha or it's, uh, or it's the state election. So this power remains intact. That's right. It'll still, it'll still happen. It'll, but what will happen is nobody would, it, this, and the central government feels that it is, has an advantage, it will dissolve. Because then they'll say that, look, we can, uh, we can control the state by doing this, having it dissolved and, and getting our own people. And then what they will do, it's far more insidious. They will have people resign from a political party. No, no, but hang on a second. If the central government under a prime minister chooses strategically to dissolve early, then what happens to all the state governments? Aren't they required to also terminate their tenure immediately? There will be an election in the center synchronizing with the date of, of, of the five-year date that is set. So therefore, the balance term of Lok Sabha will only be two years or three years as the case may be. No, no, no change in the state. Let me then put to you a second detail of what happens when a government is, loses its majority before five years is over. The COVID committee has suggested an election only for the remaining part of the five-year term, and that's what you've been talking about in your answer a moment ago. But doesn't that make a mockery of the voters' mandate? Sometimes voters will be called upon to vote for a government for five years. Sometimes they'll be called upon to vote for a government for just two, three, or even one year. Can you arbitrarily 
alter the value of the vote in this way. Sometimes it's a five-year value, sometimes it's a two or three or a one-year value. Go back to what I said earlier, even in the Lok Sabha, half the members would not be re-elected. So nobody would want the government to fall. You come back to the same point. You see, if I am elected to Lok Sabha, it's very difficult to get elected to Lok Sabha. The mood may change, uh, the mood of the people may change, something else may have happened. So nobody would want any government to fall. Basically, this is all anti-democratic. Because, because if the government has lost the confidence of the people, it should fall. And it should be elected for a five-year term. Why should it be elected for a two-year term? I mean, that's constitutionally, constitutional harakiri, if you ask. A government, when it falls, the new government must be elected for a five-year term, not a truncated two, three, or one-year term. Exactly. Absolutely. Why a two-year term? You can't, through a constitution, limit uh, the election of, 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 of persons to a two-year term through a constitutional amendment. That's contrary to our basic structure. Every government must be for. Why? Because you have to fulfill the agendas of the people. You can't fulfill them in one year or one and a half years. Governments are meant to fulfill agendas. They are not meant to make money. Let's then sum up what we've established in our conversation before I move to my very last question. There are several reasons why the concept of one nation, one election could be violative of the basic structure of the constitution. One is the one that you mentioned just a moment ago, that simply uh, electing governments for two years rather than five years itself could be violative of the federal structure, of the constitution, sorry. But more importantly, the very concept of one nation, one election in a country where we are not one nation, one religion, we are not one nation, one language, we are not one nation, one culture, that itself violates the concept of India, the federal nature of our country, that it's a union of states. And finally, the stress on the national issue in priority over the regional or the state level issue will convert slowly but pretty steadily a federal structure into a unitary structure. And that once again would be a violation of the basic structure. So at multiple levels, this violates the basic structure of the constitution. Good, it could, it could. But be that as it may, all the, all the issues that the government is talking about for changing the provisions of the constitution can be dealt with without those changes. If you're talking of expenditure, you can deal with it without those changes. Why should you have these kind of parades that are going on, these roadshows that are going on? Look at elections in other parts of the world. You have a convention center. You go and make your appeal there. And that can be televised. Why should you have this kind of expenditure and this kind of use of money power so you can deal with expenditure, right? So therefore, there will be no issue on expenditure. So all these things, and as far as calling of governments are concerned, if you have a law which says that if you defect, you will not hold a post for, for, for 10 years, a public post, there will be no defection, there will be no fall of governments. And the similarly, the so-called restrictions of the model code of conduct can be dealt with by changing the details of the model code of conduct and also yes. not imposing it for so long. Absolutely. But the basic ills of this, of, 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 our, of, our, of our authority, are that they use the constitutional provisions to destabilize government. They use the provisions themselves to destabilize government. They use the law to destabilize governments. They use money to destabilize government. Nobody is addressing those issues. You are addressing issues which can be addressed without amending the constitution. Finally, Mr. Sibyl, none of this is possible without constitutional amendments. According to the Indian Express of yesterday, the 19th, the COVID committee has recommended not one or two or three, but 15 constitutional amendments, some of which will require support from 50% of the states. Actually, because the BJP and its allies control something like 19 states and one union territory, that 50% of states may not be a problem. But what will certainly be a problem is a two-thirds vote in both houses of parliament. Do you believe they have the numbers and the strength to get these through? This is part of their political agenda. They don't have the numbers. It will not get passed. But more serious than that, they want one electoral vote for the state election and for the parliament election. That one electoral vote, considering uh, their conduct and the 
uh, and the way in which election commission has been dealing with issues will exclude a large section of our community who would be disenfranchised, unfortunately. Are you thinking of Muslims in particular? I'm not thinking of any, anybody, but I've seen what's been happening on the ground. And therefore, this is a deliberate attempt to disenfranchise Indians, particularly those who are deemed to be voters of other parties in the BJP. Well, I don't know about I don't want to comment on that, but we've seen that this happening on the ground is not just other parties. There are whole sections of the community running into millions who, who, who will be impacted by this. So therefore, therefore, you need to actually amend the representation of people's act for the purposes of having a proper electoral law. You don't want to do that. You want to amend the constitution instead. This is most dangerous. Mr. Sibab, thank you very much for the time you've given me. Take care, stay safe. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.